All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ron Petty, with my colleagues here from the Association of Computing Machinery. We're gonna talk about taking generative models to production. Uh, we're gonna focus on a couple areas, uh, some tactics and some techniques. You've heard about RAGs probably. We're gonna talk a little bit more detail about those. We're gonna talk about reasoning, uh, when to consider using reasoning or not, what that may look like. And then in addition to those kind of tactics, we're gonna talk about uh, optimization. So things like cost, time, uh, as you go through that pipeline of ML activities for these models, what does that actually look like? And then at the end, we're gonna talk a little bit about the ACM, how you might be able to find more help in particular technical areas, uh, get the help that you need. Uh, so we'll do a little introduction here. So on my left here, we'll start with uh, Yash. So. Hey everyone. Uh, okay, I, you probably can't hear me, right? No. Okay. Oh. Try that again. There okay. You go. Awesome. So hi everyone. Uh, really glad to be here, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. So my background is uh, essentially uh, I've spent a lot of time on the semiconductor side, uh, about half my career um, inside Intel's fabs building next generation technologies. And about a decade ago or so, I actually took a hard ride and went into software development. And uh, I've been really focused on the developer ecosystem side of things, where I've had a chance to work on IoT, um, what we call client platforms, laptops, and other things, releasing a number of AI-related features on Intel's uh, next generation laptops. But the thing that's really exciting me now is, is the work that I'm doing currently on uh, distributed computing and really helping determine, you know, cost efficiencies. How do you actually get enterprises, CSPs to actually leverage generative AI type of workloads into their own application development? So uh, our team and I particularly have a focus on developing optimizations and really bringing to fore some of these um, critical ideas that are sort of under the hood, right? Not at the library level, but you have to look a little bit deeper to try and understand, you know, what efficiencies can you bring in? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, I'm really excited to talk a little bit about that and also in the context of ACM. Thanks. That's great. Greg? Okay. Hi, I'm Greg Makowski. I've been involved in the ACM um, inviting data science speakers since 2008. I've been deploying data mining since uh, 92. So I've got experience at a number of startups. I've exited four times at uh, different startups. Uh, so uh, worked on about uh, 10 enterprise applications, uh, software applications with AI embedded. Uh, that's, so that's some of my background. I've been very happy with the ACM because I'm a curious guy. I like to invite speakers and learn a lot and also teach a lot. So that's some of my background. And uh, again, my name is Ron. I work for a company called RxM. We provide training and consulting around newer technologies. And for us, of course, that means machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, prior to that, cloud native technologies and the combination of all these kinds of uh, tools and techniques. So we should go ahead and get started here. Um, so okay. we'll start off with optimization. So yes, uh, there's a pipeline, there's areas of concern and cost. Uh, what should we be on the lookout for and what, what can we do about it? Yeah, and, and this is the part of, uh, I mean, I'd love to get a quick raise of hands, right? Uh, this, this pipeline that we are talking about from embeddings out to model serving and infrastructure hosting and whatnot, I mean, it's pretty complicated, right? Um, I, I don't know how many people are really, really paying attention, right? But who is a little bit or somewhat overwhelmed by the amount of fragmentation at every level of the pipeline, right? And so my question really is that when you take a look at generative AI and you're thinking about, okay, here's my set of documents, uh, here's my set of you know, models that I want to test on, and here's some level of fine tuning that I want to do on these models, and here's what I want to do in terms of storing the embeddings, retrieving the right context, at every single stage, not only do you have a choice of tools, 
You have a choice of hardware. For instance, you know, I'm from Intel, so that's not the only reason why I'm saying this, but CPUs are actually pretty darn impressive, right, when it comes to saving cost in terms of running inference. But you also have the cost of data, uh, databases. Uh, so insta for instance, how are you actually storing your large uh, embeddings? And what, what databases are actually best suited for this? And a plethora of names will actually pop up. Well, if you want to actually put everything in a single pipeline, what are some of those frameworks that will actually help you? Well, if you want to actually get the pipeline plus a bunch of other libraries working together, what's a good hosting solution, right? So um, we have a number of these, and I, I won't name names, right? And there's many over here. And so this is all part of um, the learning effort that actually goes in. And the cost side of things that typically I, I look at in talking to customers and understanding this better is figuring out where can you do the optimizations, right? At what level? And so whether you're writing CUDA kernels, whether you're writing sickle kernels, oftentimes, you know, that can get you 50 to 100x improvement. But to get there, you have to also know how to profile your code, right? And so there are a lot of tools that are available now. And maybe if you have time, I'll talk about it. But it may get a little bit too deep over here. But the idea is that at a certain point, if you start thinking about cost, you have to start thinking about some of the other tools that will help you understand um, how your GPU, CPU utilization is happening. Greg, you want to add some more on the emitting side, perhaps? Sure. I would say on how many people have done some training on RAG or worked with uh, doing a, a lookup with some kind of uh, vector database? Is there a little bit of experience? Okay. Little, so if you've, if you've built something, one of the things that you know is you know, just doing the lookup may have its own call to set up, and that may be separate than calling the LLMs. So if you're rolling out a production system, then you can kind of isolate that separate. There might be like a low, medium, high complexity of questions. And maybe if you can identify, oh, this is a simple question that I can just do a lookup on, I don't need to go to the LLM, there's ways of kind of optimizing your costs. Okay. Anything else? Uh, no, I think that's okay. Um, I mean, I'll add a couple of other things uh, in terms of optimization. And I, I know, um, so one of the key attributes that uh, we actually take a look at is, uh, you know, go to hugging face, right? So let's say you're interested in uh, running a particular use case. Let's say it's text generation. And you find out that, okay, Mixtral is releasing, has released, and it's performing really well, right? And so how many of you kind of know of the bloke, right? Uh, he releases a lot of models, uh, um, quantized models, right, in GGuf format. Good. So typically you go to one of these model repositories and you try to find out, are there any quantized models available, right? So when you have these models releasing and trained at, say, FP16 level, uh, you're obviously going to take up more of your compute, time, storage, etc. But you could actually start to quantize them. And that's actually turning out, uh, Ron, to be one of those good levers for us to figure out, okay, can you do int4? Can you do int8? Can you do fp8? And when you do that, you obviously gain on throughput. Oftentimes you do. But you may actually end up losing on accuracy. So typically for generative AI in, in production, what we try to think about is, you know, what are some of those um, uh, evaluation metrics that you want to use? So if you go to Hugging Face, they're uh, actually Eleuther AI, they have something called LM eval. And there's a bunch of, you know, use, uh, example use cases, right? But about six or seven uh, usages are evaluating your particular quantized model, right? Then you have perplexity, you have first divergent token, and some of these things that we have actually um, really taken a look at from our perspective, uh, you know, helps out. So when you actually have a good understanding of not just the model, but how well to run the model in a quantized form, you're starting to look at some of those cost factors and also looking at some of the other vectors that help you, you know, do well in production. That's great. So maybe that leads us right into other optimization areas, in this case, the techniques okay. that may be leveraged 
when deploying, building, deploying, and hosting these models, such sure. as reasoning or regs, and how can that help us? Uh, yeah, so I can go in a couple of areas. If you've built your first uh, RAG system where you're just doing lookup, that's like doing a fuzzy lookup. But once you get something basic working, what are the next steps you get to a mature product? So what you really care about in RAG is relevance to answering a question. What are ways that you can capture that? You can build it into the system. So when you ask a question, then you get back to, here's what I think the answer is, at a, was this useful or not, yes or no? And you might see that in other help systems, but that way you can fine tune or you can um, adjust your RAG system. And if you keep track of everything that was, what was asked and what was answered and answered correctly, then you can build a short list to look up quick. What are things that have been built up? And you can also use that to build a frequently asked questions. So if people are using your system, you could also say, do you want to look at the frequently asked questions? You can build that up organically. So that's one tip that, um, and another tip is if you track what questions were answered correctly by this block or this chunk of uh, 500 characters or 1,000 characters, then what you can do is redo the embedding and have all the questions that that answers. Because think of it, what's the easiest text match? You know, my question to his question asking basically the same thing that may be reworded. And so if his question comes before me, finds an answer, then if that's copied in the embedding and part of the embedding, it'll be easy to ask the next question to have a closer match. So if this paragraph matches like five or six questions, then you'll have a much quicker way to get to those questions. So it's a way of improving over time. Um, another thing to look at is definitely look at uh, like Big Bench Hard or some of the, the test data sets but don't just use a test data set because usually what you're doing for your application is gonna be somewhat different. And so what really matters is the kind of problems you need to solve for your application, the kind of questions and logic. And you wanna have some holdout types of questions. Or maybe if you know what your app didn't work on well before, then you can save that and have that in your test data set to try and improve. So those are a couple of like tips and techniques, regardless of which vector database vendor you use uh, to do the RAG just to kind of grow and mature your application. Um, so that's, that's uh, some tips on, on uh, RAG and maturing applications. Great, what about reasoning? So on reasoning, uh, one um, improvement is, you know, if you, especially if you have larger models with more weights, then there's a lot of things that you can look into like chain of thoughts, least to most, um, uh, do decomposition, break things down. Um, now, Tree of Thoughts calls a lot of other LLM lookups. So it could call up to like 50 other lookups. Uh, there's other uh, papers you might want to look at called Algorithm of Thoughts that might do two or three lookups instead of 50. So that isn't just a cost, but it's also a latency, a slowdown for your customers. But some of these different reasoning systems can help a lot. Um, another one that would be good to investigate um, is uh, React, not the GUI React, but it's reaction, um, reasoning, thought, um, action, and reasoning are three different steps and it repeats those as you're going through. And so that's something supported by Langchain. And so you can break a problem apart into different things. And then the, the action can be go do a web call or, or it could be analyze this table or it could be so whatever, uh, it can work very well with different media types as well. So kind of conditional in this context, then, you know, have some action logic. And then the, the thought is kind of thinking about what do you conclude about it? Am I ready to give an answer? So there's things like this that can help mature the, the more complex cases. Um, another thing that's nice to have in your chat bot could be give the users a low, medium, high buttons. Low button is just do a RAG lookup. That's very quick. A medium could be RAG and LLM. And then uh, the most sophisticated could be, you know, something that's more doing fact checking, more um, external third party lookup, consistency checking over many answers. But that way users get motivated. I want a quick answer for a simple thing. And then also the application doesn't have to pay high costs. 
So you can let the user self-select. Um, and then if they still want a more com complex answer, they can hit the more complex button. So you can kind of think about that as structuring some of your apps as you mature them a bit. So it sounds like some traditional computer science concepts of just divide and conquer and management and pipelining still applies in this space. Absolutely. Yes, Jim. I'm going to add just a couple of tidbits to what Greg just said, right? Which is that when, when we are typically, when I'm looking at the um, RAG pipeline, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, everybody has their own favorite library, right? But <clears throat> one of the areas that I look at is, you know, have I set it up in a way that's really fast for me to iterate through, right? So let's say, you know, we're going to use something like La Lambda index or something. Uh, you want to be able to go and iterate through different embedding choices, different language model choices, um, different database choices and other things and get the output quickly. So how can you iterate fast? And then any, within any particular choice of you know, uh, your software stack, are you then able to do the hyperparameter optimization stuff right from back in the ML days, such as you know, what's my chunking size, right? And so the sooner you can do this and the better you can do um, sort of like tracking of your uh, performance with these different choices. Um, I think it'll help you quite a bit in terms of uh, realizing the potential of that particular, you know, combination of libraries, uh, parameters, and other things going into production. And things actually keep changing as well, right? So you want to be able to be mindful of, you know, uh, grabbing the next one in your uh, non-production environment and checking it and updating it. But I think a lot of stuff that Greg said is uh, really like sacrosanct, I think, for me, right in terms of going to production. Uh, that's great. That leads me to, to our kind of final uh, section here. Before we talk specifically about the ACM, it sounds like there's an opportunity for education, sharing of experience. Um, lots of great tools have been shown over the last few days. The purpose of these tools has started to become a little clear just on the marketing and, and product days, the, the notion of repurpose, it doesn't sound maybe new to you, but if you go to your average developer or a product developer out of the Bay Area, the notion of repurposing probably isn't you know, a common tone just from the end user consumption of these tools, right? So if we're just now starting to organize around how, you know, the terminology there, what about on the development side, right? We have all these tools and techniques, it's hard to know about all these things, you know, where might we go to learn about about these without going back to college uh, for, for say? Well, Ron, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so, of course, you know, we have uh, San Francisco Bay Area chapter of ACM. ACM is, uh, I don't know how many of you know of ACM. It's, it's Association of Computing Machinery. Our chapter actually dates back to the 1950s, believe it or not. Ooh, right? I have a time for a quiz. In 19, well, actually, let me rephrase this. When was the first AI conference? Besides Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Anyone remember? 1956, at the Dartmouth conference. And the ACM created one year after that, 1957, along with Fortran. So we've been, <laughs> we've been around a while. And, and our chapter was created in the Bay Area not soon after that, right? So there is a certain history, gravitas, whatever you want, you know, that comes with it. There's two things that happen over here. When, you know, so I've been the chair for a couple of years. I'm going to step down and get kicked out um, <laughs> in June. But what we have focused on is the professional development side, right? And, you know, together, Greg and I would love to talk about this. We actually run a bunch of workshops. On this page, you can actually see um, a good friend, Ron, is going to be running the Cloud Native AI workshop uh, soon. And, and you have a list of other topics that are coming up. But in between all these monthly workshops, we actually do a focused um, you know, day-long or two-day-long session that allows you to go deep dive. And we bring in a lot of partners um, uh, that you know, take you from scratch, right? And the idea here is that from the smorgasbord of tools, you know, how do you actually make sense of what actually would work for you. So please check it out. But I want to have Greg actually talk a lot more about this too. Sure. And also, we have a, a meetup site with our upcoming events. And our YouTube channel has 200 of our more recent talks. 
Uh, so half the talks would be data science, half would be general computing. But just uh, in, in the last uh, year or so, we've had talks on, on uh, truthometer, a uh, way to, to re reduce hallucinations by doing lookup and then applying logical reasoning to the lookup results on getting many results back. Uh, just earlier, uh, we had uh, Neo4j on uh, RAG with graph databases. So we have a, a long list of recent talks um, that have been on uh, a lot of LLM applications. And then also sometimes I'll reach out to the ACM Distinguished Speaker Program and invite speakers. So we even had a, a speaker about two years ago talking about detecting deep fakes like face recognition before it came out with chat GPT. So I'm, I'm happy we've been uh, fairly good at picking topics that were um, in advance of what was happening. So we'd like to close it out first by thanking the AI user group for putting on this conference. The ACM has partnered with the AI user group who puts on the AI user conference here. Uh, please check them out. They have meetups as well with very great topics. Again, there's, there's plenty of things to learn. Uh, they're here in the city. Uh, we're down in the peninsula and the city. It's a great time to be learning and doing. And uh, if you can make it out to one of our meetings, please, please do. So we're happy to take any other questions. I guess we'll be over yeah. at the side table. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Ron. Yeah. And Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, AI user Thank you, everybody. Conference. Thank you, AI user group. <laughs>